Hello and welcome to a new Starting Conversation series brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. Starting Conversations is a roundtable discussion series that explores history and culture in New Mexico and beyond. I'm Bethany Tabor, the host, and I'm so excited to be sharing this series, producing it uh, with Three Sisters Kitchen today. Uh, it's called Culture Springs from Food. And this series explores the unique relationship between food and culture in New Mexico, bringing together voices, including farmers, chefs, local experts, artists, historians, and academics, among others. We're so lucky to be partnering with an organization that's based here in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Three Sisters Kitchen. They are a nonprofit kitchen, cafe, and community space focused on nourishing communities through food, education, and public engagement. Our conversation today is moderated by Divana Olivas. Divana is the Nutritional Values Program Coordinator at Three Sisters Kitchen, a food storytelling project that digs deep into the root causes of poverty in New Mexico. She is writing her dissertation, Red or Green, New, Mexico, New Mexican Food Politics from Statehood to Climate Crisis, as a PhD candidate in American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. She was born in Albuquerque and raised by Mexican immigrants in El Cerros, Las Lunas. Divana, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Bethany. I'm so happy to be here. I'm really honored to be sharing space with the New Mexico Humanities Council. Um, and of course, with our two panelists today, um, I'm so excited to be sharing space with you all and facilitating this conversation. Um, so I'm going to start off by reading um, your bios and then jumping into um, the question. And I'm going to start with you, Louise. Um, thank you again for being here. So Louise Cabugo is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. She's been living in the United States for five years after arriving as a refugee and work and is working with the Lutheran Family Services Rocky Mountains to complete her resettlement process. She is now an active member in the refugee community. Last year, she supported the work of the Refugee and Agriculture Partnership at LFS by providing information services at the farm and garden workshops assisting with recruitment and feedback. She's currently enrolled in NMSU's Seed to Supper Gardening course, as well as farming her own plot of land at Tres Hermanas Farm. She's also on top of, on top of all of that, Louise, pursuing her degree in nursing from CNM, uh, incredible, and she's in her second year of studies. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule with all that you do uh, to be here with us today. Um, and so with that bio, um, I'm gonna kind of jump us into um, actually, I'm going to read Christopher's and then I'm going to get into the opening of the panel. So with us today is also Christopher Ramirez, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Together for Brothers. Christopher brings an extensive amount of anti-racism, community organizing, consulting, facilitation, fundraising, and strategic planning. Building power with young men of color and making space at decision-making tables are core values he lifts up at Together for Brothers. He serves on the Governor's Advisory Council on Racial Justice, Public Safety, and Law Enforcement Subcommittee. So thank you to both, uh, to both of you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today. Um, so the title of the session is Diets and Borders. Um, we all have our own interpretation and experiences of borders from the linguistic and cultural borders refugees must learn to navigate to the physical borders we hear about on the news, to the stories of border crossings from family members. So I'm gonna start with each of you with more broad questions about borders, what they mean, how we define them uh, based on the work you all do. And then I'm gonna move into more specific topics. Uh, but before getting into that, I kind of wanna start off with the quote that can help us frame our conversation that we can kind of just keep in mind as we move forward. Um, and this quote is by Sayer Khalid Hussan. Um, and it quote, our fights must be rooted in experiences, in stories and in anecdotes. People remember these more than sterile numbers or facts. Myths are powerful magic and can turn enemies into friends. In a world where too many still, still tell stories that some are illegal and that to be free, we must control the movement of others. The work of making new myths is essential. And that's from a book called Undoing Border Imperialism. Um, and I just thought it was a powerful one that could kind of frame our conversation. So with all of that kind of intro, Louise, first question to you. So as an integral member of the Lutheran Family Services Refugee and Agriculture Partnership Program, what do borders mean in the context of your work? 
And you can also feel free to just respond and share a little bit more about what your work entails with Luther Family Services. And I'll just have you unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Okay. You ask what the meaning of border where I work in, in Lutheran, uh, at Lutheran? Yes. I think border means that the people who are who are able to, to organize and give ideas or even coordinate some, some meetings or even some events. They, I can say that the people in charge, they're the ones that we call borders. The people who are able to recruit others or to help others to, to achieve the, the, whatever they want to achieve in their life. I think that's what I can say about borders, but I am not sure, but if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll need you please to, to correct me because I want to know more about border. Yeah. <laughs> Louise, honestly, I think that makes a lot of sense because in my understanding of what you're saying, the people who are kind of facilitating connections between, you mentioned recruitment, um, yes. building relationships with others, they're having to navigate certain kinds of realities between you know, their position at Lutheran Family Services and then the people that they're working with. So there's some kind of maybe cultural borders. And I, it's kind of a broad question because like I mentioned at the beginning, it could be like language, linguistic borders, cultural, also the physical border wall, for example, between the US and Mexico. But I think the example you just shared is these like maybe cultural borders that are navigated with the people that are at Lutheran Family Services and, and their role in, in recruiting others and and maybe for members themselves in terms of how they're oriented to the space. Does that make sense? Is that right? Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. Because without them, we cannot know what to do, where to start, where to go. But right. when they plan and then we follow the, what, whatever they have planned and then they will facilitate us and make us to feel like we are home. So now we know what we can do through what the border has planned or through their curriculum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I um, think that you mentioned just now that maybe you can say a little bit more about and then we'll go to Christopher that they make that they make it feel like home um, and what is that like what is that process like in terms of making you feel like home or if you want to add a little bit more there I think that's really interesting and I think relates to what we're saying how do they make you all feel at home is that what you were saying oh myself Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I say that they let us feel like like home because it's like us as refugee. First of all, we don't know the, the language, we don't know the language, we don't know the country, we don't know anywhere, but through them, they will show us the, okay, Louis, here's the school, here's a group that you can work with, like the how they connected me to, to you, that's mm -hmm. how I can say that. I feel like I'm home because I have the people who will facilitate me and enable me to do whatever I can do, what I cannot do by myself. But through them, they just, they give me a warm welcome and I feel like I'm home. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for that. I, think, I feel like that's going to be kind of a central point maybe that we come back to in this conversation in terms of home, connections to home, connections to place how we yes. cultivate that and how borders sometimes challenge that and disrupt that. And we'll, yeah, we'll keep talking about that. But for now, I'm gonna go to, to Christopher. Um, and it's a very similar question, Christopher, just as your as executive director uh, and co-founder of T4B, Together for Brothers, what do borders mean in the context of your work? Thank you for that question, Devana. And Luis, thank you for setting the stage for, you know, really talking about how important it is that food and access to healthy food is such an important concept of home and safety. Um, and Devana, I can't help but think about, you know, the borders for communities of color where we know we work with um, boys and young men of color whose families come from all over the world, just like Louise um, has shared about the refugees that work with Lutheran Family Services. At Together for Brothers, that means we speak different languages, right? Um, we know that we currently have almost a dozen languages that the families um, and households that we most actively engage in speak. Um, and so it's important to recognize that borders are sometimes language. Mm -hmm. Borders are sometimes about also 
Um, the reality of New Mexico, where we have such a high food insecurity rate, where borders are about access mm -hmm. to even having access to food, let alone healthy food. Um, in Together for Brothers, we have an interesting food story that I want to share that kind of connects to borders. Um, we started in the summer of 2015 by gathering um, some community partners and young people and kind of just exploring what would it mean to start an organization that centers on boys and young men of color. And in particular, the first thing that came up, Devana, is love, right? The love we have for boys and young men of color, the, bo the love that boys and young men of color have for their families and for their communities. But oftentimes, right, that boys and young men of color are seen as the problems mm -hmm. and not the solutions in their communities. And so for us, food became an important and critical way that when we started circles, right, which was the one way we started engaging boys and young men of color, Monday night circles, we immediately, right, we didn't have any budget or money, so we started cooking food. And in the first couple of months, we picked up on something and it was confirmed in January of 2016 when we did an evaluation with all the with a lot of the young people and community partners, um, some adults, some older men of color that had come on as older brothers, that cooking with each other was community building and helped to reduce borders between communities, especially when there were um, differences in language, differences in food customs and, and the way that we eat food, that what connected us was being able to make and share food with each other. Um, and I wanted to be very honest, our first meals with, with each other were often like donated food, like we would get boxed and canned and maybe not so healthy food. And along the way, we realized the healthier, local, organic, and thinking about food sheds, thinking about as we, and this helped us to start to think of decolonizing diet mm -hmm. as part of the way that we reduce borders between communities. And again, what we're talking about really is the healing work that food and then an important part that I hope that we get to talk more about today are food stories. We recognize it together for brothers when we organize with each other, that storytelling. And I'm really excited to connect with humanities, right, in New Mexico, because storytelling is an, so, it, it's so important in humanities because it connects us as humans. Whether we tell those stories in English, um, whether we tell those stories in Swahili, in Spanish, in Keras, in Tiwa, in whatever language that our households speak, that we tell those food stories. Um, because it, it, that reduces some of the borders, the imagined, right, social and political borders that our, our countries or, or the state has imposed on us. And also some of the borders that I want to um, uh, bring up as I, as I close out this first question. Um, we are excited because food and food stories allow us to examine the borders of gender, right? And, 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 and not only gender, but gender and race and, and age in particular, when we talk about boys and young men of color. So it's interesting, right? We start talking about the borders of why we, we put boys and, and men out of kitchens in our homes, because right, those are spaces for female spaces for girls and women. But what we look at in restaurant industry <laughs> is we see primarily, right, men, and in particular men of color, right? And I know that you're, you can relate in your own family about, we see Mexican men or Latino men in, in restaurant kitchens all over the United States, especially here in Albuquerque. Um, but that, that border that we create between why is it okay to be in a kitchen in a restaurant, but not in a kitchen in your home? Right. Why do we why do we freak out when little boys want to play with kitchen sets or pretend to cook with their family? Um, and how incredible is it that we can use food and storytelling to, again, reduce borders, whether those are racial, class, um, language um, or gender borders um, that we have socially constructed? So I'm hoping that we get to talk more about how food and food stories are a core part of um, recognize, we have to recognize the borders, right? We have to recognize those borders that are very real in our communities. Um, but what, can I just say one last thing? Louise said something that's important, I think about, we've got to meet people where they're at and make them feel safe, like make them understand why concepts of home and safety and being like analytical about like the fact that here in New Mexico, we're on indigenous land. What does it mean? 
right? I've had incredible opportunities. Um, and I think, you know, as a grad student at UNM, as a community organizer to start to like reflect on what is the food shed in New Mexico? What are the foods that uh, have been traditionally eaten pre pre-colonial times, pre-conquest? Um, how is it that we've got to recognize that we have this beautiful introduction um, by colonization of, of, of the Spanish, of, of food, by the way, that we have to really break down, doesn't come from Spain, but comes from North Africa, comes from the Mediterranean. And it's been empower, it's been empower, it's been very powerful for me to realize that what we what we talked about as Spanish are actually more global than we think. And again, I'm hoping that more of that comes out as we talk about the beauty that is um, borders and food in a beautiful place like New Mexico. Yes, thank you so much for that, Christopher. But such a rich response and a lot to go off of there. Um, I, um, yeah, I think the the way that you put it in terms of food reducing borders and how our food practices, food traditions, um, help us reduce those borders. You mentioned different ones like the gender, uh, physical, right, um, linguistic. We've talked about that, so I also appreciate you uplifting that piece in terms of we're thinking dynamically about borders here. Can I, can I make one example too that I think is an incredible one that makes me think because of what Louise was saying about why it's important that we bring in um, communities that aren't historically connected to New Mexico, but they're, New Mexico has historically been connected to the to the whole globe. Right. So right. I remember one time we made dumplings. The first time we made dumplings, one of our brothers whose family is from Taiwan, his dad came in. He's a chef, right? But in this country, he get, doesn't get recognized for the 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 experience, the rich experience he has back in Taiwan, but he comes and make dumplings with us. So it's, it's, what's exciting is a lot of the brothers have never even tasted dumplings, let alone made dumplings. But what's incredible is we start to having people see, oh, these are like empanadas. Yeah. Or our, we had an Afghan brother who was like, oh, we have a food like this in Afghanistan, and it's incredible because that's when when I say about reducing borders like having young boys and young men of color learn to make Taiwanese dumplings, you'd think doesn't, wouldn't connect them. And yet one of the things that that, and I can go on about other food stories that we've experienced, but what's powerful is people seeing connections and even recognizing differences, because I think you can recognize difference and still reduce borders right. um, with food and food stories. So those Taiwanese dumplings were a huge hit, number one, um, but it was just powerful for people to be able to recognize differences and make and still make connection with each other um, through food and through cooking together. That's the other thing, right? It's not just the eating, but the process of making food, we consider to be part of healing justice, right? Making food for not your, just yourself, but for others. Absolutely, thank you for that. Thanks for clarifying and adding that piece. Um, and I, I wanna go back to you, Louise, and within this conversation that Christopher, all of these really great points that he's been bringing up in terms of food practices, food traditions, and, and food cultures um, helping to reduce borders. I was hoping to hear from you, Louise, how you work with people's different food traditions and cultures in your programming with Lutheran Family Services. Um, Christopher has mentioned cooking classes, um, and I know that you're involved more on the production side of like gardening and growing the food. Um, and I was hoping you could share a little bit more about what that what that looks like in terms of the food traditions and practices that, that come up in your work? In terms of food and tradition, it that last term, was it on May, we had a, 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 the class of, of cooking. So we learned about the different foods uh, from America. Since okay. we didn't know anything, but <laughs> we always cook our own food. But that class, it was so awesome and it helped me to know how how to cook uh, American food and which one uh, which one is healthier that I can eat because we were just eating anything but that one it was about how to choose health food and it was so awesome it took like eight uh, eight weeks it was six weeks okay. it was so awesome I learned a lot about the other one that we are we are growing. Mm -hmm. Yes, now we, it happened that now uh, us as refugees, we are growing some of the food that we used to grow at home. Okay. And now we will tell uh, uh, Eliana, so we, can we have this seed and this seed? So after that, 
people they will they will be able even to sell and get money from the food that they are growing themselves so it's really awesome i've learned a lot both the cooking and in the garden mm -hmm. and myself i'm growing mine even this morning i was at the garden planting some uh some tomatoes eggplants and beans and corn even uh some 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 chili green chili some nice. green chili mm -hmm. yeah so i about the food for sure i've learned a lot and i'm willing to go ahead and learn more and more in our country we don't know we we don't know what the meaning of full plates the meaning of full plates we don't know we just eat yeah. but now <laughs> as i was interpreting i learned i felt that i'm learning a lot and even this time i was willing even to take uh, to take the course and get the certificate but and unfortunately we didn't we didn't get a teacher the teacher wasn't available to teach us but we're supposed to start and uh, next last week but we haven't started and they postponed the the classes up to august okay. now we on 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 friday we started the gardening classes so um just an interpreter uh, at the same time uh, a student right yeah exciting that sounds incredible i wanted to kind of pick up on one of the points you made really briefly about um how you're growing food from back home do you have any examples of of what kinds of things um you all are growing that's that's new to or you know from back home any like familiar ingredients yes like we we used to grow like corn and uh, and beans but not the way we are growing them here oh, okay. it's we are just grow we just go and and dig a big a big a big space and we just we don't even follow lines and whatever but <laughs> and yeah sometimes we find uh, another type of uh, uh, of eggplants we call them nyanya shuma Okay. it is an african eggplants they are greenish they are good here we they, we grow them a lot uh, at the farm where we are we are planting and some amaranth so it's really it has been a good good experience and i like it so much because i want to eat health food i don't want to eat yeah. junk food mm -hmm. no <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's, that's great um i and that's awesome you were planting this morning just a few hours ago getting all those crops in the ground That's yes a few hours ago we went early in the morning i just get out of the of that place around 10. we went there at 5 a.m at, at 10 they already br brought me home because i told them no i have another meeting to attend so i have to go <laughs> yeah a dynamic day for you that's awesome thank yes. you but i left uh, early and uh, and becca there in the farm since yeah. they knew that i'm going i'm coming to attend this meeting right right yeah thank you for being here again um yeah. and christopher this next question i kind of want to um go back to the point you were making this really important one about the the work that you all do specifically with together for brothers around the borders with like gender roles and gender and you started to talk a little bit about that in terms of um, how young men of color are not necessarily encouraged to be in the kitchen space in their own homes, but then professionally we see that they are most of the workforce in terms of kitchens in our restaurants and etc. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you all are exploring healthy masculinities through conversations rooted in food cultures? Yeah, I think, you know, what's, what, one of the things that's core for us, a core value is really working on gender justice and also healthy relationships. And those are two of the pieces that I want to lift up when we say healthy masculinities, we're really talking about making sure that we have healthy relationships where boys and young men of color are about um, boundaries, consent, strong communication having expectations when in all of our relationships, but also being asset-based, meaning that we know that boys and women of color know their own assets and know that in any relationship, whether it's individual or in our families or in a romantic setting or in a supervision setting or in a school setting, every relationship, you have to know the assets of everybody in the group because it makes those relationships healthier. Um, and so when we think about cooking, you know, one of the things I didn't say about the restaurant industry is, it's you know no big secret that most 
kitchens in restaurants are super sexist places, right? Where misogyny and homophobia are, are unfortunately like just over, over present, right? It's machismo to, it, 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 to a really gross extent. And so one of the ways that we're doing that is just by having boys and young men of color cook. Um, and can I just share, there's two powerful stories I wanna lift up when I say that is, one of our brothers, and it really hit me because I had, um, um, I didn't get a chance to be in all the circles. Um, we have multiple circles, right? Art making, biking, cooking, community justice, transit equity, so many other projects, we, so many projects we do. But I had jumped into a cooking circle where we were cooking with blue corn, right? And um, what I loved is one of the young people, CJ, was cooking with his younger brother and younger sister in the kitchen. And it was clear that he was, cooking with them on the Zoom because he was asking questions and you could hear, and I, and I know this family really well. But what I wanted to appreciate is there's, you know, I was followed up with CJ and his mom after just that, that he, that's how he cooks almost every time because he's also caregiving for his younger siblings. So in this case, I want to lift up, it's not just cooking with your family, but what does it mean? Can you imagine the boundaries that were, that CJ is transgressing to be a caregiver to his younger sibling. And by the way, Devana, it, it may not surprise you, about a third of the boys and young men of color we work with are caregivers to younger siblings in their households. And it talk, and that really brings up the importance of not only creating healthy food traditions and healthy relationships among siblings, but how much that makes a big impact in a family. Um, and so I wanna bring up that. The other, the other story I wanna lift up when I think about um, is um, Jesus. Jesus is a young person that we first met a couple years ago um, at a job fair we hosted at Highland High School. And at the time, he was a CNM student and he is paraplegic and is in a wheelchair. His family's from Mexico. So not only are there, um, there's, you know, his mom doesn't speak English, there's Im immigration issues, but being in a wheelchair means that there's a lot of barriers or borders for Jesus and his family. He, um, during COVID, when we, we pivoted to doing everything online, it was the first time Jesus could participate with us because transportation was a huge border for him, a, an obstacle for him to be able to participate with us. He did one of our first online cooking cohorts. And one of the first things that happened is we were able to deal in Michael, from Three Sisters Kitchen, who is a former educator, but also one of the staff at Three Sisters, because Jesus could not um, use, safely use his stove at home in his wheelchair. So we got him uh, a hot plate so that he could still cook with the cooking cohort. Michael did some teaching with him and his mom, right? We even had an interpreter help Michael because there was some making sure that Spanish, um, his mom was able to help Jesus safely to be able to do that. But can you imagine Jesus had never cooked with his mom, right? He'd never been able to do that because he couldn't access their stove and oven to be able to cook with her. And can you imagine that how the relationship changed between Jesus and his mom when he was able to learn some family traditions of cooking and be able to cook with her because of that cooking court? Um, Jesus is doing the cooking court this, this summer with us. His family has been getting refreshed ever since COVID started. And it's been incredible to see how that has changed Jesus's own uh, um, outlook of his assets, right? As a person with disabilities. Um, and it's been incredible to watch his growth. And the food is only, the food and cooking is only part of that. But I wanna bring that up in terms of, you know, for us, it's not just the, the healthy masculinities isn't just about gender. It's not just about race. It's about all of the, the, the identities that we bring when we talk about food and about kitchen and spaces with food and, food and cooking um, that is incredible to have seen. And, you know, the last part about that healthy masculinities, I think there's some something really important I want to bring up. We did a project about um, a year ago where we were able to get some funding to look at food and mental health through being able to talk about family food stories. Um, and so one of the projects that our cooking cohort did in the winter of 2021, and that was January through April of 2021, is we documented food stories from a whole cohort of young people. And we worked with Three Sisters Kitchen and then also another organization to lift up those stories. And you can actually see them. I just wanna do a quick plug on our Together for Brothers website under stories. There's these beautiful food stories where um, brothers shared. And one of, the, one of the last stories I just wanna deal in about healthy masculinities 
we worked with a brother whose family's from Isleta Pueblo. And I was so excited because I was like, oh, that's great. We're going to be able to feature this native food story. But something incredible happened that I think really illustrates healthy masculinities and borders. The brother from Isleta, he has a Filipina aunt. And one of the food traditions that happened is his aunt showed him how to make lumpia, Filipino egg rolls. And it was his favorite food after his aunt cooked with him. But you can imagine, think about the healthy relationships and healthy masculinities of promoting an aunt, working with her, her nephew, right? An aunt from the Philippines, a nephew who is from his little Pueblo. And one of his favorite foods now is lumpia. And that was the food, the food recipe and food story that he wanted to lift up being from his little Pueblo. And it just, in my mind, it really helps to illustrate why right? Having a healthy relationship between a young person and family, being able to learn through, through cooking. I can also imagine there has to be an Isleta twist on the, the lumpia that um, that brother made with, with his aunt. But again, it just illustrates when we cook together and when we do things together, we break down those borders. That's what helps promote healthy masculinities, right? When boys and young men of color see themselves as assets, see other girls and women and other people who are non-binary as assets in their communities, um, we've been able to really see how that impacts. And, and here, at the end of the day, the other thing is, think about this, it's a broader sense of health too. And maybe that's what I wanna leave on Devana about healthy masculinities. We really see that connected. And when we say health and Together for Brothers, we talk about behavioral, um, emotional, financial, physical, spiritual, but also community wellness when we talk about health. And when we think of something like food and healthy masculinities, we're really checking all those boxes about how food um, and having access to healthy food, but also preparing healthy food in our homes um, is, is part of that. And again, part of healthy masculinities when young people can um, start to see themselves and others as assets in their communities. Thank you so much for that. Go ahead, Luis. And I can add a little bit about what Christopher said that he, he remember when they were cooking uh, on Zoom. Exactly, our instructor also were, were doing the same. She was called Nicole. So whenever we, have, we had a, a, a course or we have learned like we can learn, like today, next week, we'll, we'll be learning as we are practicing. Everybody will be at the kitchen. So we learned how to, to, to cook, to make pizza. So we'll start the process at the, uh, from the end, from the beginning to the end. So we bake, we, we mix the fl everything, we put it in the oven, and at the end of the class, everybody will come up with, with a pizza. <laughs> so it was really cool. And also like we, how we can make healthy salad. So also we'll go to, everybody will go to the kitchen. So we'll learn the ingredients and then we, everybody will come with his or her own salad. So it was so nice. And how we can imagine the healthy salad or the healthy pizza that other people are making it being junks, but for us, we will just turn it as healthy food and it will be, it will be beneficial for us and our family. So most of the families who, are avail, who avail themselves to learn for sure, now they can go to the to the market to buy healthy food, not just any food, but they know what they can they can do. Myself, I was just uh, among the people who can buy anything, but now whenever I go to the to the to the market, I have to know this is the the, the healthy food that I can I can buy, and it will not just it it will not be just like other any food that I could buy before I took these classes of. Uh, how we can know health food or how we can eat healthy. Right. It's really, it was wonderful. And I'm, I'm so happy to learn again about the, the, the uh, to be among, to learn about what the Three Sisters Kitchen can give, can, can teach us because I know they, they make healthy food too. <laughs> yes. yes, that's definitely yeah. part of what we, what we do at Three Sisters Kitchen. And um, I think related to what Christopher was saying, thinking about, how health, healthy and health is also relates to um, the community, the, the neighborhood that we live in, the access to grocery stores that have affordable quality, nutritious food available for us to be able to shop. So it sounds like, you know, this, this um, opportunity in terms of 
learning about the kinds of ingredients to make, like you were saying, what might seem like an unhealthy food, like pizza, you were learning strategies to make it, to incorporate it, to be healthy and to, uh, yeah, to that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you for sharing that. I am, um, I wanted to follow up on a point actually Christopher made that reminded me of a question I wanted to ask both of you, especially you, Louise, in the context of um, making connections with a place that you no longer live in um, and how you sustain those connections. So it was in the context of Christopher sharing the story about the, the brother from Isaro Pueblo being connected to this auntie with Filipina heritage and experiencing this food from an entirely different place, a different culture, but maybe in some ways being connected to that. Um, and so I wanted to ask about, about what that is like for you in terms of how you sustain connections to a place um, that you don't live in any longer. And especially thinking about families that are here, refugee families who have young kids or you know, what kinds of lessons in terms of the place that's you know, important to them and where they're from, but is no longer the place where they live, if that makes sense. And how food might help make those connections. Okay, for sure. Like uh, I can say that it make food uh, had made connection to the place where we are no longer live in a, and where we, we are now, it, because for sure, sincerely uh, uh, speaking, in our country, especially Congo, we doesn't use like chemical when we grow food. Mm. So we eat natural food. But when we come here, we just we don't have those natural food, but as we are learning, we know which one it will be health. It will be a health food for our kids as uh, as well as for ourselves, because like uh, our, our kids also they will come here they will be eating anything. But as we have learned, because we are the one who who, who can go to the to the market to buy those food, so we will not just buy them anything. So we say no for our kids, so we have to, to buy this food because this is the healthier one. And we didn't know it before. And now they were able also to direct us to the store where we can buy, the, we, can, we can get the healthy food. Mm -hmm. and instead of just going anywhere, or we don't know any place because we don't know anywhere, but through them, our instructor and the boarders, so they just help us to know where we can find the, the food, which is, it's very uh, healthy for us and our family. Yeah, and, and from what I understand from what you've shared too, Louise, uh, it sounds like the, the kind of gardening work that you're doing with Lutheran Family Services in terms of growing your own crops in, yeah. in a natural, more organic way, like you mentioned, you know, back home in the Congo, you didn't, it wasn't like chemicals and all of these additives in terms of how food was being grown. So I, I I'm kind of understanding like maybe even the gardening being that's a way you're connecting in terms of like hey this is how we've always grown our food in these like more natural ways and not using chemical inputs and um I, I feel like that's something I'm picking up on from what you've been sharing in terms of your experience this exactly this of, yeah that's that's a way you're connecting with what you already did back home in the Congo and yeah I, I feel like that's that's what I've been picking up on yes that's that the points you got you got me very well <laughs> uh, is there anything more you want to add there in terms of, of the gardening and, and, and that way that being a connection to, to home? I, I think the, uh, another connection to home is that, uh, is that if, when, when we came here, we didn't know that also we, were, we, 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 we are able to, to grow some food because we didn't know that even in America people can farm. No, we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. We had to realize that even if you are willing to do it, you can still do it and grow your own food. If you are not lazy, it depends of who you are, of, or, of your mentality, because even other people, they don't, if you talk to, to, about them, to them about growing their own food, and you just tell them, we will, we will prepare the garden, we will give the seeds, we will water the everything you also just go there and plant and take care of the uh, of, of the plant but they don't even want to hear that mm. but if uh, like myself i i did a culture before i, I was announced uh, at home so that it's still in me so uh, the, the get being in the garden and growing some uh, some natural food it is still in my blood so 
for me, going to the garden and growing natural food is not a big deal to me. Yeah. Yeah. So that one, I see it as a connection because we didn't even think that in America they, they will ever, <laughs> ever grow something. But when we came on the field, we saw, okay, so we still connected to what we were doing at home. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's so incredible. Such an important space in terms of, yeah, being able to connect with the land. Go ahead, Christopher. Vanna, can I, can I add to, because Luis, if you just said something that was really important. One of the other pieces that we do, and it's a little bit of a pivot on the food, but mm -hmm. about growing food and getting outside. Um, we were in a meeting with parks and recreation and outdoor um, open space folks for the city and the county. And one of the interesting things that happened is there was somebody, right, an older white man who was talking about how, oh, refugee, like in particular, because we had we had a refugee and an immigrant, yes. um, young men of color who were in this, like it was a Zoom space. Yeah. And he was like, oh, the immigrants and refugees don't really care about, about um, about getting like parks and outdoors. Like that's not one of their concerns. And what was really powerful is as I was getting ready, Devani, can you imagine to speak and be like, what the heck? Um, <laughs> there was, here's brother Saeed Mahdi from Afghanistan talking about Louise, what you're saying of like, wait a second, my mom always has had a garden or, or grown her own food. Even when we first came from Turkey, they immigrated first to Turkey and then the US, his mom has had plants even when they were in an apartment right, from both medicine and for the make sure that she has access to the food she cooks with. Luis, Luis said the same thing about his mom from Mexico. And what was really powerful is they basically pushed back on their own about why, Luis, what you were saying around not only organic or natural ways of growing food, but why outdoor space and parks and recreation were important to immigrant and refugee families. And they really, that, that counter narrative, Devana, that I know you're familiar with as a grad student, but our communities don't understand Louise, right? Why it's important that, wait a second, we do value that. And we, they under, and those families also understood why, then thinking about like why, when we were looking at the redesign of a park in the international district, Phil Chacon, the neighbors, the, the boys and young men of color and their families that we were having involved in that process talked about why they wanted a community garden where it was both medicine and food to eat why that was an important part for the most diverse neighborhood in the state of New Mexico, right? Because Luis is right. Those, those are traditions that families have and they wanna maintain. And it's part of creating that home and safety wherever we're at. And I love that in New Mexico, we have that tradition where, right, we have indigenous communities, first, pe first people that have a strong connection to the food shed that we call what we call New Mexico now, but other communities have brought in different things that I mentioned earlier, right? It's why we have particular, you know, other foods that we eat in New Mexico. Um, but I think it's just critical that we don't like dismiss the connection that all new Mexicans, whether we are, are indigenous to this beautiful land or we are um, immigrants and transplants, those food traditions are important. So I really appreciate Louise bringing up, right? We sometimes think that um, organic and natural are only for rich white folks in New Mexico. And the reality of our, our communities where we come from, right? My own family story from Mexico, we come from places that we grew, we, we did grow food organically before, right? Before big corporate farms changed that, not only in the US, but across the globe, unfortunately. But I love, Louise, that you bring up that importance of why, you know, and not only eating um, organic or natural food, but also that connection to the outdoors, because that's something we also have to push back on in, in a community where, unfortunately, we see, right, um, low-income communities of color have the lowest quality of parks and least amount of access to open space in our communities. And, and that there's an important counter narrative that those are really important for families, um, again, to create that sense of home and safety for themselves. And they have a right, right, sovereignty. They have a right to be able to self-determine how they have access to food, how they have access to outdoors. Um, but they also have a right to be at the decision-making tables, like Louise is saying, like in her own experience, she has a right to be at the decision-making table where we're deciding how, how families have access to food. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you both. Um, yeah, Louise, <laughs> clapping, I'll clap too. <laughs> that was great. And actually, you will, you both are taking the conversation where, um, where I wanted to kind of head next in terms of talking specifically about the land and connections to the land. 
And I, I think both of you are kind of getting to that and we've touched on it, but the way you were explicitly talking about outdoor spaces and um, having access to, to land to, to grow food on. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you both within the context of thinking about borders, like physical place is really important. And so with that, you know, wanting to just think about how, how we work on how people connect to land, how do we cultivate connections to land with communities that have little to no access to it? Um, and, I, you know, for example, Louise, you were talking a little bit about the, uh, the garden space. Like, I feel like that's one example. Um, but I just kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time there just because, you know, we have been talking about the different ways that borders show up. Um, but I, I don't want us to forget the really important one, which is like physical space, the, the, the way that, you know, at the beginning, Christopher used to something along the lines of like these state imposed borders, like literally even physically saying there's a wall here and controlling the movement of people in a particular place is a really important function of, of state power. Um, so I wanted to think about that, like how, knowing all of that, we know people don't have access to land. A lot of people don't or very little access to it, or maybe the land that they do have access to. Like you said, it's like really low quality parks, for example, Christopher, and what you just mentioned. So how do we con continue to cultivate those connections um, with communities that have little access to land? And Louise, go ahead. Okay. I think the way we can still have a connection with the borders to have access to the land, it is just a want to learn more or and not even just be like restrain ourselves from them just being being there with them still asking question which land is good because they are the one who knows which land is is fertile we don't know anything no and which seed can grow uh, can, can grow here on on this kind of uh, of uh, of sand like here in in, uh, in new mexico as we were learning on friday we were told that the climate of new mexico it's not like the other climate uh, of other any other places so i can be having any ideas or seeds that i i, I want to grow but as long as i don't know the land i don't know this uh, the temperature mm -hmm. i will not be able to to grow i will say ah i uh, i planted my seeds but they did not uh, grow or give fruits because why i didn't ask uh, like advice from the borders who or the people of the land who know where and which season and what time and which temperature I have to use to be able to harvest what I want to do. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like an important component what you're speaking to there is it's the land also is the climate, also is the soil, the sea, like all of these different factors. Everything. And people intimately know that is such an important part of it in terms of exactly. any relationship to the land it's going to be multiple factors um so i that's a really important point thank you for for uplifting that um is is there anything you want to add christopher yeah. yeah there's actually one you know one thing about growing food um more than half of the young people boys and young men of color we work with live in apartments um one of the first things that we were able to do during covid is um i loved refresh included getting a tomato plant from silver leaf and one of the things that we're able to do, Devana, is work with one of your good friends, Travis McKenzie, oh, who's been part of Project Feed the Hood and a part of gardening uh, all across Albuquerque. But what I love is Travis, we did a lot of good partnership with him when he taught at Van Buren um, about the school-based garden there. But Travis was able to do a bucket garden workshop so that regardless if you didn't have access to land yourself, you could have a bucket on the stairs in your apartment or even inside if that was where you could take the bucket outside and make sure that the plant got sun or put it in a window. But I love that even when we don't have access to land, which I love that the Lutheran Family Services has this beautiful garden that um, refugee families can connect with. And even when they don't have access to get to that garden, bucket gardening is a great option. Um, and there's, there's another story that I want to lift up when it comes to like access to food, um, because it's a, not necessarily about land, but I think it's an important concept. Um, the second summer, um, sorry, the 
third summer of T4B in the summer of 2617 was when we um, started our health impact assessment on transit equity, right? And one of the things we're really proud about is we connect transit equity and access to, right? Albuquerque is now the second largest city, only Kansas City larger, that has free public transit and access to paratransit, right? Because we fought for five years to make that happen. But we, one of the things we learned about transportation was a social determinant of health was access to healthy food. Um, one of the things I want to bring up, though, that I think is a really great story about borders, um, one of our youth that we met in the summer of 2017 as an intern first with us on our health impact assessment team, um, Saeed Mahdi, whose family's from Afghanistan um, and they identify as uh, Muslim, is that first summer was the first time that we had to stop and think about how we interacted with Ramadan. Ramadan is a month long, right? Um, is a Muslim ho uh, holiday where folks typically um, fast from sunrise to sunset. So the first summer we messed up. We were not good allies. We, he would not, he would cook with us, but not eat during the, the meal. And I look back at that first Ramadan in 2017 and realize how much we messed up in 20, but since that first summer, one of the things that we learned is about how we, like, we learned about, we did an iftar at the end of Ramadan with him. And the next Ramadan, we were really smart. And we were like, wait a minute. We learned from other communities in, um, especially in Muslim countries where there are Christians and Buddhists and others, right, that are not Muslim, is that oftentimes people will um, fast in solidarity or do iftar, the breaking of the Ramadan fast during the day at, you know, each night there's a, a breaking of the fast. So we started, we started doing something important. We shifted when we, we, we ate all of us mm -hmm. to be able to break the fast with um, Sayyid Mahdi and other Muslim um, youth that were, would be part of our circles. And the thing that, that it was great was then we had young people learning about different communities and about why food and, and thinking about our own bodies, right? Because some brothers would get hungry even waiting an hour longer to eat during our Monday night circles, for example. But I just wanna lift up the idea of access to food and that is not only how we're grown, but like that, that sometimes, right? The sacrifice that communities make and how that connects to important things like faith um, and expressions of faith. And I just wanna really thank Saeed Mahdi for being somebody who's been patient as we've learned. Like I said, that first summer, I look back and think about how horrible it was that he just refrained from eating in front of us and we all ate in front of him. Um, how bad New Mexicans of us, right? Not to like um, accommodate our guests as, and I think that's the other thing about the reality of like, what does it mean to be in a place like New Mexico where food, whether we're talking about a feast day in our, in our pueblos or, um, and I think Devana, you and I can relate in, in, in Mexican households where the, the first thing you do when a guest enters your home is offer them something, right? Um, either to drink or eat. But I think, again, what, I'm, what, I, what I really value is going through that learning process to make sure that part of our gender and racial justice framework is understanding that when you are more inclusive of all communities, you become stronger as a community overall. Um, so we've learned a lot about Muslim communities. And one of the things can I just share with you, I'm really excited. We actually recently worked with the Albuquerque Public Schools Refugee and Newcomer Support Program to actually put together the first Albuquerque specific Ramadan resource guide. Like, uh, um, and it was a cool thing because we worked with a local Muslim artist who did a graphic facilitation one, one pager resource guide on how schools can be responsive to Muslim students during Ramadan, Muslim students and their families during Ramadan. And you know, the, the one, one thing about understanding, it's not all young people. Some young people don't have to fast. It depends on your age and all these other things, right? That families make individual decisions about who fasts and who doesn't. But what I love is when we're educated, it makes us a stronger community. And um, it's exciting to me that we can learn things about how food impacts different communities. And, and you know, the other thing about like food is food sovereignty has to include understanding just like Louise was talking about earlier, the chemicals that we put in our body when we used food that's grown with chemicals, but also the relationship we have with food where we know fasting is part of a lot of our different communities at different points in time. Um, 
celebrating with food is a part of like the breaking of the, the iftar, the breaking of the, the fast is a part of so many different um, communities, uh, food customs. So I just wanted to bring up that as a also a particular kind of a different, a twist on the story of um, how access to food is important and how we talk about when we eat and when we don't eat and how we recognize like sharing customs with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such an important part of, um, I think earlier you used the phrase transgressing borders. We've also talked about reducing borders, but it's also, yeah, deconstructing them, shifting them. And I think you made an important point earlier too of like, we can recognize differences while still celebrating everything that makes us, like that brings us together, that connects us. Um, and so I, I feel like that's a really important point to just conceptually how our conversation, we've kind of talked about borders in different ways, which is really exciting. And I feel like this is an important one where it's, you know, it's, it's challenging them, but also re redrawing them, right? Like thinking critically about what they even are. So I, yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, one of the, can I just share with another part of that transgressing borders? We started when, we, you know, one of the customs of some communities, Muslim communities, is one of the things you break the fast with water and then eating dates. Um, and I think it's a really great thing that some of our brothers now know that, right, from, that are from not from Muslim communities that have been able to partake in that particular process. And in, in particular, like the, the importance of why dates, why water, why sharing it with each other first before you even eat your full, you, uh, eat the rest of your meal. Um, but just again, that transgressing of borders where we often do that, right? Like we often, and I think about like how often we create a narrative like boys and young men don't belong in the kitchen. And then we realize in so many of our families, we have traditions where boys and men do cook, right? Yeah. Like I think about like in my, in my moment Mexican family, I'm sure with you, with yours, cooking on a grill becomes a tra act of transgressive, right? Boundary crossing for those Mexican dads or tios, right, our uncles, to, to make carne asada on the grill. And yet, it's a clear, it's clear that that's a really important part of our cultural tradition. Um, and I love that when we can take those counter narratives and realize how critical they are to our own communities and to our community stories. Absolutely. We're getting close to the, to the hour that we, that we have together for this conversation. So I want to offer you all as really, you know, powerful leaders in our community, um, an opportunity to maybe ask each other a question um, or maybe just offer something that came up for you in terms of what the other person shared, um, just as a way to kind of close out our, our, our conversation here today. And if there's anything you wanna add, you know, um, in addition to that, but I, I wanted to give you all the opportunity um, cause I know this is the first time you're meeting each other. You do some similar work, work with similar communities. Um, so if there's anything that came up for you in terms of what the other person shared that you found interesting or a question that you still have, um, I want to make sure we have that opportunity and then we'll, and then we'll close out. Um, so I'll start with, who wants to go first? I have a, I have a question for Louise because I love that you talked about, um, you know, learning about food from here in the United States and New Mexico. Um, it reminded me, one of our, um, one of our youth organizers um, whose family was also from the Congo, um, taught us, or we would try to do healthy snacks. It was, I'm thinking about the summer, it was the summer of 2018. Um, but Abuela taught us that um, because we, one day we were having watermelon with each other and we realized it was an important thing where we were talking about how watermelon's important in Albuquerque because of the mountains, right? The Sandia Mountains, which is um, watermelon in Spanish. But Abuela was able to teach, there was a really important moment that happened because Abuela taught us that um, watermelon in Swahili is tiki tiki maji, I think is what he taught us. Um, but I just, I love that, you know, not only learning about New Mexico or US food, but I think there's an important moment. Um, and then we realized we needed to do more to teach each other about our own foods. And so after that we had, um, we, 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 we practiced making um, other foods from Afghanistan and from the Congo, from other places. And I'm hoping, what do you think, do you think there's, what are, what are the opportunities? I would love, for example, for, to connect with you about how maybe doing a cooking class with us about some uh, food from the Congo. But what about the importance of sharing your recipes with people in the United States and New Mexico? Because I feel like that, I love it when we can see our refugee communities as assets to teach us um, as well. Okay, Christopher, thank you. For me, uh, 
if you invite, you will invite me to your kitchen, I'll be willing to come and share my ingredients with you because uh, like as I was saying, I've learned a lot of different uh, ingredients from my, 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 my instructor in the last classes. That's why I decided that I have also to, to get my own certificate because at that time I was only an interpreter, but I learned a lot and I had that task or that say that no, I have to get a certificate on this class because I find it interesting because I learned more. And if they can be willing to let me also share my ingredients, I'm really willing to do it. Okay. Is yeah. there an example, Louise, of, of a dish maybe from the Congo or something that you could recreate um, and share with and share with us here? I, it's like the way we cook pilau. We we have like rice. We call it pilau. pilau. So there is a yeah a, spe a, a specific way that we can cook those pilau. There are specific like ingredients that we we put together to make that delicious rice. And it's also different from the rice that I've been eating here in America. Right. Like, mm. Yeah. Um, Louise, can I, just, can I just say Palau, uh, uh, I've tried it a couple of times and it's amazing. So we would love for you to come uh, and, and do that. Um, Devana, can I also say, in addition to a, the kind of a question for Louise, I think the one thing that I realized I didn't bring up, one of the ways that we've worked with Three Sisters Kitchen, and I just wanna bring up, you know, we've worked with you on the shifting narratives around our food stories, incorporating ideas of like talking about food and poverty when it comes to racism, colonialism, but also for us, sexism. Um, and then the other way that I just wanna bring in around borders is we're really excited. We've gone through the process and similar to like what Louise reminded me, um, we've gone through the food business training program at Three Sisters Kitchen. So one of the things that we're doing as an organization is we're in the middle of planning for a social enterprise where we're going to create a baking co-op. And I think, Devana, you're familiar with, but when we went through the food business, we went, we got trained in food business first and then the food business management. Um, so one of our program coordinators, Baruch, is a food business manager certified as well. So we're now looking at a baking co-op that has as our first product is an empanada kit. Um, and one of the things we decided is we didn't wanna just make empanadas, we wanted to make a product where families would have to finish making it together. And we recognize empanadas is one of those things, and I kind of said earlier, that actually crosses a lot of communities where everybody has a version of an empanada, which is either sweet like fruit or savory with either meat or veggies um, included in it. And so we're excited about how do we then be able to address economic justice, right? Thinking about that, the project we did around shifting narratives around the table and poverty, where we can start to say, how do we build capacity for boys and young men of color to open their own, number one, to be in our baking co-op, and then also to help them open their own food businesses. Um, and I think it really taps into the assets that we have of the communities that we're working with here in Albuquerque that come from all parts of the globe. Um, but it's exciting to think about how um, food business, and especially in a neighborhood like the International District where we do so much work, right, where you can literally eat the world in the International District, literally, right, whether it's a restaurant or a food truck um, in that in that neighborhood, or, in, and I think the other thing is some of the caterers and folks who've gone through, um, I know we've tapped in in the past some of the, um, the Afghan community, there's no, I think they're actually now, since COVID, there actually have been at least one, if not two restaurants that have opened. But previously, you could only get Afghan food if you got catering from one of the families, um, which we had done on more than one occasion. And we also have had um, some catering from some, some local um, Congolese and also some, uh, I'm trying to think of one of the other Tanzanian um, um, families in our, in our community. Um, but it just brings up to me the importance of um, having food be a vehicle for, for liberation, right? For not only individual health liberation, but the potential to open your own business and share those incredible um, uh, food traditions in, in a beautiful place like New Mexico. It makes us stronger, again, as a community. I know I've said that before, but um, I'm, I'm excited because I think that that's one of the opportunities, right, Luis, of having a garden for refugee families and having them be able to practice not only their food traditions, but come up with new ones. It makes me think, I love at the farmer's market last year, I tried my first kimchi with green chili. 
Whoa. Why not? Why not that. have kimchi with green chili? Why <laughs> not mix Korean and New Mexican food yeah. products? Um, but it was incredible. Um, or I love when you were mentioning Palau, Louise, it made me think we had a, a chef who's Costa Rican, who's gone through the food business training program, Devon at Three Sisters Kitchen. She now has a restaurant. Um, um, it's called Buen Provecho, in, um, right? Um, but she came and taught us the black bean and rice dish that they make in Costa Rica. And it was great because it was so different from food that the brothers have traditionally made, but it was that it was, they could see the similarity, but even, even though it's very, right, um, pinto is what it, the beans and rice dish is called in Costa Rica. Um, I just, it, you know, food business is also part of that, about borders, right? And that economic justice and liberation that's possible when communities can have, again, it's, it's about self-determination, decision-making, right? When it comes to food sovereignty, it's not just about the food that we individually eat or in our households, but what we, we should be able to have um, access to in our communities, um, in our school cafeterias, Devana, can that be a next thing we do with the Humanities Council, explore how do we have healthier, but also more um, inclusive and representational food in, in our schools? That feels like a whole series know, that you can help us with. I would love that. And I, that's such an important conversation. Um, and I, I love the way that you were talking about um, creating new food traditions. Like when you all were talking about, when you mentioned um, Pilao, Louise, I was thinking, yes. oh, what's a like New Mexican Congolese recipe, you know, in the making, there's something that's going to happen. <laughs> something will come from that. We're, we're speaking it now. Um, but that that's exciting to, to think about in terms of collaborations and the, you know, the, the assets you mentioned, the Christopher, that refugees bring in terms of the recipes, ingredients, familiarity with different crops, et cetera, that is just going to enrich, further enrich the food cultures that are already present here. Um, and so I, I really appreciate that point. I wanted to make sure to uplift it. Um, and Louise, before we end, is there anything you wanted to ask Christopher or anything you wanted to comment on? I know I, I mentioned that um, and wanted to give you the opportunity in case you did have something uh, you wanted to ask of, of him. Uh, I, uh, I, I'll say thank you for everything that he, he brought out. As he said that food bring the community together. It is true. As we test the, as, as we, we, we are planning to, to teach people about health food, it brings the community together and it makes us one. As he was saying that, that you, you can test the whole world as you are still here in America because of the, <laughs> and I like that, Christopher. I'm so, wow, yeah, mm -hmm. he's right for sure. And I think yeah. it's because it's, we're nearing our lunch hour, Louise, but talking about Pilau and tasting the world is making me very hungry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you both so much. I think on that point um, of your a reminder that it is lunchtime and uh, we're probably, I'm also a little hungry <laughs> after <laughs> hearing about all this and talking about delicious foods. Um, I think we'll go ahead and end. We have, um, Bethany, do you say the closing remarks? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Louise. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I'll be in touch via email in the next few days just to, to you know, wrap up and make sure you all have each other's contact. Um, and then we'll stay on a few minutes after we officially end the recording here. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you guys so much. Thank you uh, to both of you for bringing so much, so much knowledge and wisdom. You've been so generous with your time today. Um, we're so lucky to to have this conversation. Thank you, Divana, for an excellent job facilitating. And uh, I can't thank Isha and Divana enough at Three Sisters Kitchen for um, working with me on this series. Um, and more information uh, on Together for Brothers, on Lutheran Family Services is gonna be linked in the description below of this YouTube video. Um, and yeah, you know, something that is uh, that was refraining in my head while I was listening to you guys, something that we talk about a lot uh, at the Humanities Council is um, the tricultural myth in New Mexico, this myth being that the only cultures in New Mexico are uh, white, Hispanic, and Native American, which is a complete lie. As, as stated, it's a myth. And, um, you know, I think about there's such strong um, food culture and food identity within this land. Um, and then in welcoming other people, it, it becomes, food becomes a language that uh, in welcoming other people from other cultures, um, you get this, the, this mixing and, um, you know, that just, that, those thoughts really 
came through for me while I was listening to you speak. And so I think that it's um, just incredibly po powerful, the work that you are doing. So uh, thank you so much. And we will sign off from there. Okay. <laughs>